You're listening to the broadcast on the Focalizer Network, the only show that covers all your favorite fandoms with your host, Justin Thomas. I think that you put season two, three, four, Jack Rackham against Littlefinger, and he'll he'll bust his ass. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Uh, he has a far better library <laughs> than Littlefinger. A lot of it is focused around this brothel to begin with, so... And what goes on at brothels? And, yeah. Good hey. conversation. Good yeah. conversation. I always felt that Max was kind of very similar to Silver in some ways. She's also very intelligent, but it, I, I guess the main thing they share is they're underestimated. She knows how to read people. She's observant. She observes what's going on. And, and she can she play it. sees that this is important, just like he did, so... There's no better, like, uh, training for if you're going to work in, like, any type of public service or any type of business where you have to negotiate than uh, being a prostitute in a problem. It's, yeah. I know many women that are very successful CEOs. Very good job, Shadow. That's how they started off. What's going on, everybody? Justin Thomas here, and I am here with Shannon, who has agreed to come in and talk a little black sales with us. She also jumped to the rescue with the Westworld questions and is a good friend that actually watched black sales because I suggested it to her and wanted to have somebody that could come in studio and talk it over with me. So, Shannon, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on. So, obviously, I'd asked you to watch the series but kind of give a a little bit of an idea for anybody that's listening some shows that you watch on a regular basis just to give a kind of idea of what you're into so they know where at least your opinion is coming from sure okay well i'm not sure actually if uh how many people would be familiar with the shows that i like to watch because most of them I watch on Acorn TV, which is a British TV streaming app. I prefer, or I like, I enjoy mystery uh, police procedural dramas that are based over in England. British television. British television. Um, I'm a big Doc Martin fan, which is... Uh, I watch that. That's an excellent... Um, and you that, recommended that to me. I did. But you don't have a podcast for me to come on, so... Yeah, uh, I don't. Maybe yeah. I'll start one. Yeah, don't give me more uh, It's an just excellent do it, show. Do what you're told. And uh, I just love it. It's a medical dramedy. And the interesting thing about British television is, and I don't mean to sound like a snob or anything, but in my next series after I finish this Black Sales one, I'm actually going to be doing the golden age of television is what I'm calling it right now. It's going to discuss uh, British television in one of the episodes that I already have scripted out. When you say that you like British television, I know you do watch EastEnders and stuff like that. And those are kind of more like silly... um, uh, I guess you'd call them like well, soap, soap opera shows, but yeah. but but also, I mean, we have a, a lot of silly shows on our end. But when you say like medical procedural shows and uh, detective shows, they are known for taking the proper. Not that all American TV doesn't, but you will see far more accurate portrayals in British television of. Uh, police procedures and uh, the medical procedures. I don't know what it is about it or why they do, and we I'll have you back on for the other cast because uh, <laughs> <laughs> you would be somebody to talk about this. But it it is interesting, and the British, uh, the Brits over there, they hold television to a higher standard uh, as a medium, which I think is really coming in. It, that's why the golden age of television is considered to be happening as we speak. Uh, they hold it to a higher standard. They are uh, they come from the theater more. There, there's no Hollywood there. There's London. There's the theater companies and groups. So they hold it to a higher medium. And you do get some pretty quality shows. I know you like Victoria, which I also enjoy, which I right. highly recommend. Yes. So you like historical period uh, the stuff. The Crown. The Crown. I, Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, The Crown was uh, really good. And uh, yeah, they do hold... Uh, they do take pride, I guess, um, in... Presenting something that's um, more true to form, maybe, than some of the Hollywood-produced shows. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the Ameri- you know, we have a lot of great shows as well. There's plenty of shows out there that, that aren't the shows I talk about that are shows that are, that are really great on both sides. But yes, it's uh, 
it's interesting. I think it has to do a lot overseas that the Brits don't have a uh, Hollywood. They come here when they want to get into movies, which again, we'll be talking more and more about because that's not necessarily a, a higher form of of entertainment as of right now. Right. It's more television there. Yeah. And- yeah. You also watch Game of Thrones. It's something I recommended to you, which yes. I, I hope you're not lying about. I mean, when I tell you to watch something, I, I'm not like, hey, you should check it out. It's like, hey, watch it and then like give me notes. So, Well, you know, I mean, you're really good at sparking, I think, uh, the curiosity um, that maybe someone didn't even know they had. Um through your podcasts and so forth. Uh, well, thank you. I call it manipulation, but the, po- <laughs> the podcast is excellent too. So you you had, t- can you tell everybody what podcast you, you first sparked your curiosity? Well, about Black Sales? Yes. Yes, it was the, I believe it was the first one you did, Laying the Groundwork. Uh, uh, that's the incorrect name. It's the... Uh, sorry. Setting the Scene. Setting the Scene. Setting the Scene. Setting the Scene. It really uh, sparked my curiosity in uh, the characters and also, you know, the, the the time period, because it isn't a show that I would typically be interested in at all. Absolutely, because you, uh, for the most part, right? I guess not as far apart as, as, as you would think, but uh, I definitely can handle gore and stuff a lot more than you, and that's just a normal thing between females and males, you know, uh, Maybe because we don't have to experience so much gore. You're not like a Pirates of the Caribbean person, are you? I am not. Neither am I. It's like, not something, you know, that type of uh, genre is not anything that I was interested in, even um, in fantasy or f- factual. Yeah, and they made like 18 of them. So, right. well, now that Johnny Depp isn't so uh, fan-friendly, we might not right. see too many of them. Uh, right. Yeah. But uh, he, he did some pirate stuff when he wasn't supposed to do some pirate stuff. But uh, it's like football players doing football stuff off the football field. But uh, <laughs> right. yeah, it's, it's an issue. But yeah, I'm the same way. I had no interest in it. And I'm a, I'm a huge history buff. I think that that's what I mean when we differ. You know more about... I know more about the current queen and her immediate family now than you do. Yeah, but I... I am more familiar with the, at least the the monarchs of the uh, Middle Ages than I know. You had to tell me that they technically, that that now I know from watching The Crown, but Philip decided, I thought he was dead. Right. I thought, I'm like, yeah, but but I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah, but then I can break I mean, typically my history, uh, as far back as I like going, would be, you know, 1900. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, but uh, Justin, again, inspired me and encouraged me to check out Victoria and I found myself doing my own research as I was watching it um, and learning uh, more of the historical facts uh, about her and her family. Absolutely and um, yeah it's just I guess it might be more useful I mean you just know stuff that's relevant. And it, <laughs> that's going on, and I'm like, well, uh, but hey, you know, you know. I mean, it's all relevant, uh, but, you know, uh, just some people, I mean, hey, you know what? If it wasn't... To each their own, just, you right, know. but to each his own. Uh, but and, but their each's are better than some, so... Uh, but it is good to, you know, it is good to have these people around you that can inspire you to be open mm-hmm. to different genres and different um, historical events and... Uh, uh, take a look. Oh, and, absolutely. And, and if, learn some new if you things just surra- and find some good entertainment along the way. Yeah, if you just surround yourself with people that are completely like you, uh, which in my case, that would just be prison, but um, <laughs> you're not as likely to explore and well, find you're not going to grow and, yeah. you know. You'll still grow if you eat right, but you're not gonna, Right, yeah, right. But, you I, know, you're not going to expand your horizon, so to speak. Um, it, there's that saying that you need to understand how we got here to understand what's happening. So I understand exactly how we got here. I have no fucking clue what's happening. Uh, <laughs> so, no. Uh, but all that aside, uh, yeah, I did the... The two episodes for the introduction of the series, and one was the Treasure Island connection, which I I, I kind of steered away from. Uh, it's still a, a great cast that does cover that. I just didn't cover it as in depth as I planned because of my most hated thing to have to do, and that's that's give a spoiler warning. So here it is, right now. If you've not seen Black Sails, we are only covering episodes one through four of the first season, and this is to inspire people to watch it. But I will not say that we won't bring up something that's happened later. Uh, so just general spoiler warning, if you're peeking your nose around Black Sails and you just don't want to know anything, you should probably just watch my introduction and then come back. Spoiler for everything ever right now. 
that's your only warning. But and we I gonna- really did enjoy the sh- the show because I listened to the the background that you gave through your podcast. Oh, there's no doubt that that was a really good podcast. Mm-hmm. I mean, just definitely. Really, it's just I love it. So the first time I had watched the series, I, I I was not familiar with the history at all. First, once I finally stumbled upon the show, which was when it was. I think just going into its third season, so about two years ago, is I watched it and I watched the first few episodes because I'm on Game of Thrones, Vikings, you know, like uh, the average shows we watched. Then I watched it. And like I said, I didn't have any of the like those just general background I usually will have for time periods in history. Uh, I guess it was too close to nowadays. But I watched the first few episodes and I immediately started looking things up because I, I couldn't believe the just the way the, like the pirate code the power structure that was actually enforced on these ships you start off this series with a british merchant vessel being pursued by uh, a ship which ends up being the walrus and there's the black flag that is raised the british captain on the ship that's being pursued uh, makes a uh, note that it is captain flint's flag and this invokes fear in him he makes a comment, something along the lines of, have you heard the stories and all this? So, me right away, just a small little thing. I was like, oh, they got, like, sigils, not all just, like, the, what is it, the skull, skull and cross. Yeah, yeah, which is more prevalent uh, in, in films today, but it's very interesting, and we'll get to it later. Actually designed and created by a major character in this film. I see the boarding of the ship, and I, obviously there's a lot of um, killing and action right off the bat. And I'll get into my pros and cons and things I liked about this scene and stuff in a minute. But you immediately see the quartermaster, Mr. Gates, and Captain Flint looking for something. Flint is desperately looking for this, what ends up to be a book. And it's established that the captain, Captain Flint, is in a tight spot. And he's in a tight spot because he's chasing after this certain piece of information that supposedly all you know at this point is uh, is going to lead them to supposedly this this large you know prize this large amount of gold and you you see a a quick discussion during the taking of this ship between captain flint or one of our main protagonists and mr gates his quartermaster and you start to realize right away just by what they're talking about that this captain is not in complete control Exactly. And maybe in the moment he's in complete control, but the consequences of them not taking a prize that that results in the crew having a lot of money to be distributed. I think the crew was under the impression that they were going to there was going to be a big share to go around. Well, yeah, yeah, the you see the stress of the captain and he's speaking to what you find out is his quartermaster, Mr. Gates. And he mentions that the crew's not going to be happy. And the first thought in my head is, Oh, oh well, they're not going to be happy And this. Well, and Flint says there, are they ever happy? Yeah. So you are, are never happy. They allude to the fact that they have been chasing after something for a good period of time. And the men have had a low cuts because of this, because the prizes they have taken, are secretly between the captain and the quartermaster, Flynn and Gates, are taken because they believe it to obtain this information that will eventually lead to this humongous, you know, prize beyond anything that they've ever gotten. But they can't tell the crew this. Um, But this is a... They don't trust the crew. They don't trust the crew with this information, exactly. But the point is, is they're establishing right away that Captain Flint is in a vicarious situation. He's in a dangerous situation. The quartermaster, his quartermaster, Mr. Gates, makes a comment to him that he doesn't know if he can sell this to the crew because they have their, I I don't know his exact position, but I'll call him like the CPA of the boat, the accountant, uh, come in Mr. Dufresne, and he will, he mentions like, oh, it's only going to be like eight pieces uh, per crew member, which is not good whatsoever. And he mentions that two men were injured. I think like two men were injured or, and one was killed in the taking of this prize. So the men aren't going to be happy. Again, I think, oh, well, they're not going to be happy. He's he's Captain Flint. You know, he's the main character. He seems to be kind of a badass. It's his ship. Um, What's the big deal? Turns out it's a real big deal. And they hold a lot of power over the captain. And the captain's place is never secure on these boats. I was very, very surprised by 
what was being portrayed to me in the first 15 minutes of this show that it made me stop the show and do the research. Uh, not the extensive research I've done now, but in the way it worked, uh, the way that when quartermasters had power, quartermasters hold more power when they're uh, not on sea. Captains only have complete power in the moment of battle uh, or decisive uh, situations right. like a dangerous mm-hmm. storm or something. Mm-hmm. They, then it's a dictator. Then everybody must comply. But besides that, this is a, a union. This is surprisingly democratic. Uh, more so than our current government in, in a lot of cases. Right. It's like, uh, you know, he has to keep his uh, crew happy because they voted him in. Yes. And he does not. <clears throat> it, it, it can be challenged at any time. It's not like every four years or every two years. It's like every time somebody's pissed. Right. So uh, it's he's the crew has given him, placed him in power. And if he can't deliver, they can take it away. They can take it away. He's right. And I mentioned this, and I recommend everybody to go check out the the cast I did setting up the in giving a lot of this information I'm giving. One thing I mentioned in those casts is that there was a lot of uh, cases of captains uh, or ships going through 13 captains in two years. That's that, unbelievable. Yeah. So these captains didn't hold this all-powerful dictatorship that you would think, and they're making men walk the plank uh, or anything like that. And that, that you know, seemed to happen on the uh, British naval ships. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's another thing is that you know you see them right away recruiting, and they're recruiting after taking this prize once they have this ship's men, and they are then. Going through this man named Singleton, who seems to be a, uh, he's opposing Flint, and he's mentioned that that was another thing that sparked my interest. I'm like, well, who right. is this guy? Why don't they just get rid of him? Well, right. they can't just get rid of this guy That's because he this is a democracy on this pirate ship. It's, hey, he's... The, he, and they all honor it. They do, know? yeah, surprisingly. And I'm sure there's cases that people didn't, but if... The, there is a pirate code, and I share it in those podcasts, and we'll link the information below. But yeah, they did honor it a lot, a lot more than you would think. Because I mean, just the word pirate kind of invokes like a yeah. uh, dirt ball, total negative thing. connotation. I mean, a pirate. I mean, you just think that's what I've got out of this. It's you know, like they weren't half bad. Oh, I mean, yeah. I know they were stealing and all that, but they weren't the most upstanding business and people, businessmen. But they weren't. It, it's the the thin line. If you've heard seen ancients behaving badly, and they uh, look at cases like Attila the Hun and Julius Caesar, they they will level like these people on like levels of oh, insanity or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's and we're not saying killing is ever. Uh, Joseph Thomas is not condone killing. No. Yeah. No. Like n- rarely ever. Never. At, like rarely ever. Yeah. Uh, so, but. There's like the whole, did they kill for um, political reasons or did they kill, were they just going out and being murderous and killing people because they were just just crazy sociopathic murderers or did they slay, which still wasn't okay, a whole bunch of people for like the good of the Roman Empire. So we'll be doing more of a, a broad overlook, but it's important to discuss what peaked at least my interest and I think your interest to a point was this shocking display of the the politicking on the sea, right. as I like to call it. And they are recruiting right away. When they do attack this ship, the one of the uh, issues I do have now that I've done all the research about this uh, period and the practice of piracy, they most likely wouldn't have been firing as many cannons and the ship most likely wouldn't have had as many cannons on the pirate ships. Um, there's a plenty of reasons for this pirate ships were, is think prohibition. Think about how the, uh, bootleggers souped up their cars and to become faster than the police. Pirate ships were smaller, more maneuverable, stuff right. like that. You, you don't sink ships because you can't get the, the prize, you know, the money or the goods, tobacco, sugar, so on from a ship that's on the bottom of the ocean floor. So you, you definitely don't blow holes in the side of it. You want to hopefully invoke enough fear and that's where it comes in with captain flint's flag to have them surrender and a lot of times a lot of these pirates that were even part of the crew uh and you see this right away with the singleton who's recruiting people there's a political ambition for this as well because this guy is is recruiting new members for their crew because he knows that he can hopefully secure their votes 
uh, in order for him right. to take the ca- captaincy from Flint, who is on a bad streak. He's on a low swing. He's not doing well. His guys aren't happy with him, a lot of them. He's the most prominent pirate on uh, in Nassau, but he is on this just total slump, and he is unable to... He's always you know, in pursuit of the big one, like... Erka de Lima is yeah, gold. the which person the, who's going to... You know, well, I'm going to buy these lottery tickets because I know I'm going to hit the big one. Or idiots. Gonna, you know, you yeah, idiots. they just... Dumb people. Yeah, just chasing his tail to an extent sometimes. Yeah, he... Um, He's making a lot of decisions that are not good for, uh, that, well, that, that he's know, making a lot of decisions that he feels are better for the men, but he's not including them in these decisions because he cannot trust them. And he is seeking this like big prize. And this is, well, I don't know if he can't, he doesn't trust them. I mean, it's never, I don't know if it's clear if he can or can't trust them, but he doesn't trust them. Well, he feels it's and not that worth, angers them. Well, yeah, it, because all they see is that. Okay, somebody. Two men were injured. One man was killed. So that, and they didn't make any money. So that. Well, is, he's looking at the big picture because he needs that. He needs that log. With, yeah. You well, know, they're attacking. That's what he's looking for to get to the Urca, but he's not telling them this. Yeah. Immediately, we become aware because of this small conversation with Gates in Flint, in the actions of Singleton that a- after the battle ensues and. Uh, it, it, there, there's finally a calm because they have the ship under control. That you start to see the politics, and you start to you already are aware that he can't be honest with his crew because he is searching for something bigger. But he is pursuing a ship that isn't that he knows not to obtain a lot of uh, things that would be valuable: sugar, uh, tobacco, gold, in some cases. But he's pursuing ships uh, through this naval intelligence that he's received, which they will discuss in in the hopes of capturing a, the prize of all prizes. But he can't trust his crew because he's afraid that they'll go back and they will talk about it in every brothel and bar there. And then it will create a whole bunch of competition and spread a whole bunch of word. And he can't do that. But also, he can't really have these what I would consider high risk, low yielding ventures. Right. Two men were injured. One man was killed. I, it might have been one man injured. One man killed. Doesn't matter. These are brothers. This is like your original band of brothers. He can't tell them, but it's also getting harder and harder. Right away, you realize that his quartermaster Gates is getting to the point where he he can't really explain this to the crew. He can't really say, "Well, we didn't get it this time" because it keeps happening. Right. They keep pursuing this information. If I have any issues with opening up the large amount of killing that is done. Uh, by Flint's crew in the ex- the excess of uh, cannon fire in the size of a ship, which these are all like just nitpicks. But just to be fair, these are some of the things. And some people really throw a fit about this, but those people, I don't know how they enjoy anything. So, I mean, yeah, it is not really true to form that they would have taken this prize in the way they did. Because, like I said, the, the next thing you see after you are keyed into the struggle between Flint his quartermaster and the crew, you see Singleton, a man that is uh, vying for the top spot, the captaincy, is recruiting men. And they wouldn't have wanted to kill all these men. Right. Because they recruited these men. A lot of people were mistreated. So there is a little bit of excess violence in the first episode and a little bit too much gratuitous nudity. But also, you have to consider that whether you care or not, the creators of the show have to appease the network and sex sells, violence sells. It's an old phrase, but it's still very relevant. And you see a lot of these things uh, dissipate very quickly, uh, especially in the second season. A lot of it goes away. So people like to see big ships. I do, actually. And there's uh, plenty of uh, authentic fans that are very educated on the subject that are willing to look past stuff like that. The long and short of it is the first almost 15 minutes, I believe, of the taking of this prize in the the hierarchy of this system that I was so unaware of that I thought, no, 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 no. He'll just make that guy walk a plank, which there's one account of that in history actually happening. No, you got to, it's like you're promised a whole bunch of your constituents and you're not coming through. So they're going to, you know, vote in Donald Trump instead of you. Right. So they do what they preach. How did you feel when you when you watched that same scene? Was that something that was interesting to you? Because you had listened to the um, luxury of listening to those wonderful podcasts before. I did. And thank you for the views. But yeah. uh, 
was it still uh, interesting to you the way they portrayed it or did that catch your attention like it caught mine because that, that was the sticking point for me so i mean there was a lot of violence and that's okay because i mean that's that did happen and uh it's just it was interesting to me that uh captain flint obviously to me he seems he's more strategic it isn't just they're going from one pursuing a ship getting a big chest of gold and splitting it and they're all rich you know they had to work it was there was more work to it and strategy uh there wasn't a bunch of gold floating along or whatever salt silver jewels whatever floating around the atlantic ocean yeah that's a good point and um and that that brings us into like the next part of it is they're the only case that you're going to realistically see in history and in this show because it is still historical fiction. This is a pre uh, prequel of sorts to Treasure Island. So it is a very interesting mis- right. mix of historical fiction that is placed as a prequel to hi- a fictional book, but actually has historical figures in it. And in some cases, like I said, in the cast before, it like stays, stays obscenely accurate to some of these accounts like that i i was surprised that they did uh upon second watch and knowing these uh things so it's it's a very interesting mix of a show but like you said it's not like just oh man let's go here and here's another ship and let's get some treasure it was calculated and especially in flint's case he's looking right. at the big picture and he is uh we get to know more about him which we'll talk about in a minute but that brings us to our next point is yeah, they didn't have a bunch of gold because they had to take it back home. And at that point, home is NASA. And we're introduced to our another main character, in my opinion, and that's NASA. NASA was a pirate republic for a, I believe, 15 to 20 years. I could I say it in the cast before. Mm-hmm. But for a good amount of time that ran without uh, British rule or any rule. And they, they, they governed themselves. And it was a pirate republic. The Guthries, who were a real Scottish clan that did trade on NASA are portrayed as the trade bosses in this instance. So they have to have goods like tobacco and sugar and things like that to bring back to be fenced. So she can, or they, Eleanor Guthrie, uh, who we meet that is the trade boss who is right. interesting. I mean, you feel a little bit different about, about right off the bat, but they have to bring back, uh, this isn't just, Oh, a big chest of gold. And here we go. That's what they're seeking. Right. And they're seeking the Spanish treasure fleet, which is something that's real, something that really happened and something that was highly pursued by pirates. They did pursue gold and gems and stuff in certain cases, and that was mostly the Spanish treasure fleet. But that's what Flint is chasing. In most cases, the easy money, because it's not protected by huge ships with guns, are merchant ships. So that's what they'd go after. So they, So we see them... Obviously, the crew's not happy with Flint right off the bat in the first episode. Gates is sweating a little bit to try to explain this. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do get a few people. Singleton is allowed to get because they have in their budget, I believe it's room for one carpenter's mate and the cook. Because before the ship was completely taken, we get introduced to a character... Even if you haven't read Treasure Island or seen the show, you're most likely aware of or aware of the terrible restaurant, Long John Silver. But we don't meet Long John Silver. We meet John John Silver, Silver. a young, uh, enthusiastic go-getter. He's an opportunist, um, and he's also an observer of people and the situations that are going on around him. Yes. He uses that uh, to maneuver his way... uh, through the pirate life. print, yeah. <laughs> he is seen, as as we said, they are looking for a certain book. That book they're looking for is a schedule for the Spanish treasure fleet. Right. And when they find the book, they find a page is ripped out. Because there is a certain gentleman that uh, is has a short-lived uh, spot on the show and in his fictional life. It rips out a page from this book that Flint ends up finding to his, you know, displeasure, finds that the one page he needs is gone. Uh, they don't really explain who this guy is. He's just somebody that must have known the importance of the schedule. Silver is a witness to this. A young John Silver is a witness to a man uh, clinging on to a piece of paper. Now, Silver is not... 
he claims to be the cook of this ship once they find him, but it's not clear on what his actual role was. He's not high up. He's he's below deck, and he is hiding out, and the other gentleman that took the page comes down, and he's clinging to it. So Silver has no idea what this page is, but he, he like you said, he's an observer. So he observes that this is something of importance. Right. Because the man, it falls out of his shirt or something like that, and he sees that he, like, scrambles to pick it up. So not only is he trying to and keep it. And I think it, that guy was a cook. He could have been. Yeah, I mean, Down there. I, yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah, I think he was. He definitely didn't have a position of uh, battle or, you know, combat or whatever you want to call it. He wasn't, he wasn't, he in, didn't have a station on top of uh, the he, ship. Yeah, he, he, he wasn't a prominent member. And I don't know what Silver was doing down there, but. Yeah, not getting killed. Yeah. But, yeah, I, oh, I believe because he does say he's the cook and that's where Silver gets his idea that right. he, he should say he's the cook. But he, he sees that. There is something of importance to this man and that not only is it something that this man for some reason thinks he should save from the pirates that have now taken the ship. You can tell that he is obviously not happy that Silver sees it. This is something he should also keep from Silver. So Silver being observant Mm -hmm. and somebody that likes to take advantage of opportunities when presented, even without having the full information. An argument ensues when Silver asks what that piece of paper is. The man asks him, like, what is he not doing on top? What are you, some type of coward? And this is brought up a lot, and an interesting thing we'll talk about, is Silver a coward? Because he is below deck, he's not above deck, but again, those men that were above deck, especially in this portrayal, didn't do too well. So he is found, finally, by the crew, and he is alone. He's no longer with that man. That man is on the floor, so they don't show it, but he obviously isn't a complete coward. And He is asked who you are and what are you doing? And he says, my name is John Silver and I'm an excellent cook. Right. And that's how we meet John Silver. Uh, A bright eyed, not no patch, no parrot, both legs and, uh, you know, a nice big smile for them. And he ends up becoming part of the crew through the recruitment. And like I said, this is something that it was very this is how like 80 percent of the recruitment was done through other ships. So. It was not in the interest of these crews to kill everybody aboard. We see this, too, when it comes to the very final part of this siege of or this taking of this prize. When Flint is uh, talking to the the captain of this British merchant ship and is asking about where that page is. And he has no clue at this point. Obviously, he thinks he's the obvious one who tore it out to. You yeah, because he's like, this book. guy will know what's going on. Right. Kind of, Clint is kind of talking to him in a low voice. He's um, above deck, and they have him, this British merchant captain, uh, tied up, and he's talking to him in kind of discreetly. And uh, the British captain kind of picks up on this, and he, he has no idea who has the paper at this point, the captain, so he has nothing to give Flint. He says, call your men off. I have nothing to give you. Call your men off. And he realizes, he goes, you you can't, can you? You can't call them off. He goes, how long until you're the one that's strapped to this mass or, right. you know, and because right. uh, this is in this again, uh, really shines a spotlight or a floodlight, like I like to say, on there wasn't just this security and just this total authority for the captain. And... There was a lot of misgivings, uh, and, you know, the atmosphere was not good for Flint. There's that saying that there's no honor among thieves. Well, there's quite a bit of honor to preserve the well-being of the whole, the crew as a whole, as we'll see. So, moving on, we see NASA, like I said, which I consider to be another main character, and we kind of see the inner workings of uh, the island and how it works with how they fence their goods. Right. Um, how it is a pirate republic. Uh, one of the pirates tells John Silver, the new crew member, as they're going to a gentleman's club at the time, uh, that he goes, is this, uh, I forget how he phrases it, but he's pretty much asking, like, is this a British island? Is this controlled? Well, who? what is the government here? Yeah. like what, Who yeah, governs this Yes, island? yeah, who governs the island? And the uh, gentleman says, we do. So we get that right away, too, that, oh, wow, okay, so they actually had, like, islands, too, which we, you know, New Providence Island, which we know as the Bahamas now, and Nassau, which is a beautiful resort from what I uh, hear, (laughs) is, you know, it's got its beauty in the show, but it's definitely nothing like it looks like now. So we, we immediately... We immediately move on to the next thing that I'd like to talk about, which is the hierarchy outside of the intermediate pirate crews. 
which would be the trade bosses right. and, and like the government of this uh this island which who is eleanor guthrie yeah the guthrie's and we learn that, that she has yeah, a father guthrie's. flint says he's gonna go to mr guthrie mm-hmm. and you can tell that mr gates the quartermaster doesn't really approve of this uh, because Flint tasks him with securing boats, which is something we see today. Uh, he's going to go out and campaign for Flint. But Flint is going to go and try to get some information uh, from a a higher source, which we find out is the father of the active trade boss. His daughter is the one that's actually there doing it. Gates doesn't think this is a good idea. And we meet our next character, that is Billy Bones, uh, who is a prominent part of the treasure island story but it doesn't live very long for it but is definitely a big player uh for the setup of it and he is told to just go along with flint and make sure he doesn't do anything stupid so this shows you right here that captain flint might be stretching a little bit so billy is portrayed i would say what would you think like as a uh, just a good he seems like a good lad he seems a good lad and he's uh just well-grounded type guy good head on his shoulders he needs to keep uh captain flint reeled in and i think that that's an interesting uh aspect and this is just thrown at billy he doesn't like you know yeah it's told to him what like something along the lines of he uh that oh flint trusts you and appreciates your advice and so on and then when flint hears billy's coming he asks who is billy but this this is another case (laughs) of uh this is another case that we see of a pirate this is played by tom hopper who's a very big guy and strong guy and we've seen him in the taking of the prize do some pretty gruesome things but he doesn't speak doesn't look like you would expect a vicious murdering pirate to look and this is overall kind of what you see at least with the main characters and now this isn't what i would consider a uh, inaccurate portrayal of these men it's just showing that these are you know a lot of them are ex-navy men a lot of them are sailors uh that have been mistreated on other ships like i said that's how they do their recruiting and people that may be falling into hard times and this is the best way for them to make a living so we're seeing people that you, if you just looked at him at first sight and you hadn't seen anything, this is like the first half hour of the first episode, but if you haven't had the setup for it, you would think that, oh, that's probably one of the British soldiers or right. one of the good guys. Right. Uh, the good guys, I guess. Billy definitely said. looks like a non-violent, like, non-criminal type. He's a softly spoke, I mean, he's a gallant gentleman. Right, but, he is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> know why they call him billy bones he's not skinny yeah that's that i think they picked tom hopper just for that but that that's his name in the uh maybe it's kind of like how italians call like a guy like you know like little joe when he's the big guy yeah uh, not funny italians yeah but um we find out when we get to nasa that things are much different than you would assume there i guess not as different as i thought with the pirate ship because that is more of a dictatorship the trade boss runs everything flint seems to be going over his head this is established right away and he is Taking along good old Billy, who I feel like this is this is an on uh, this is a reoccurring theme with Billy and something I really took note on on rewatch. Billy is constantly shoved into situations, not always just dangerous situations, just with ill regard to informing him or in with the assumption that he is gonna kind of. Billy's the last one to know. Yeah, Everybody. well, he's not the last one to know because the people on the ship don't know, but like they well, bring true. they bring him into the scheme and. They don't give him what I feel is, and this this ends up causing issues. Uh, they don't give him the respect. It's like he hears things as they have to come out. Like Flint is explaining this story of how he found out about the Urca de Lima's gold, which is this story of this they Spanish soul. If he, they put him in these positions, but they treat him like he's on a need to know basis, and that he's I mean, just going to fall r- to rank, right? Which again, in that that structure, that's not even a, the proper word for it. But he's going to fall to their side, right? And just go along with whatever. And he is a pretty uh, he's a straight shooter for as, as far as you can tell yeah. right away. So it, I mean, it's disrespectful. I mean, I don't think anybody would appreciate to, to be treated like that so there's just a disregard for for him in general um and he is forced to make some pretty pivotal decisions really quick you find out that there is a threat by the british and the spanish as well there is a large ship called the scarborough that is ported uh, not far off and we meet some british soldiers 
right away right. as they come into ironically when flint is having this meeting with mr guthrie mm-hmm. and the, mr guthrie is not he's not thrilled to see flint at his house like this is like you know if you are just a regular worker at uh, mcdonald's you know which nothing wrong with but and then you go like find out where the owner of mcdonald's lives and you pop in his door right you know i mean and it's even worse and you're a murderer Right. Uh, so yeah, you know, I mean, like he, he's and he's got and he's got people there that he's talking about, like the next like quarter pounder with, or, yeah. or the super big because it, there's other men there from the legitimate side of the business because they're fenced. They they fence the goods. They take the sugar. They take the tobacco. They they clean it up. They get the blood off the barrels and they repackage it in legitimate trade for legitimate sale. Yeah, for legitimate sale. But you know, the people that buy it are buying stolen goods. This is anytime things are transported throughout any time of history that creates piracy so he is not thrilled that flynn has came there billy is finding out that the reason they have not struck uh any decent prizes and have taken losses is because of this hidden agenda of flint's and he hears this as flint is forced to tell it to richard guthrie who again is not really jumping up to aid him in stealing uh, a large, large amount of gold for from from the Spanish treasure fleet, and as I said before, Spanish treasure fleet was something that was actively pursued, and it was considered to be dangerous. It, it, yeah, they did it a lot, but it wasn't like something that didn't come without consequences. Spanish, uh, the Spanish fleet was far superior than uh, any other fleet at at this point in time. So we have some uh, soldiers come in. They find Flint with Mister Guthrie and Billy Bones and some uh, so. He's with some undesirables. They attempt to arrest him, and we get a little bit of a, a Mexican standoff or a right. shootout. So this this just leads to um, some awkward situations. We, I think that the overall theme of this first episode is that they don't do it heavy-handedly, in my opinion. But they're not who you think they are, because we meet Mrs. Barlow, right? Who is a nice Puritan woman at first look, and this is at this home. She's yeah. inland on New Providence Island, and Flynn has his. Uh, other She's like, like this little farming lady, you know. Yeah, I guess this is where like the uh, the again legitimate people are, but it's a Puritan community. So again, this is Billy seeing his house for the first time and him realizing, okay, like the feared Captain Flint now has this nice woman, but this nice woman she doesn't uh, stutter one bit no. uh, to take the, the wounded man. Are you know so that raises some flags right there? Okay, she's obviously accustomed to situations. You know, I mean, imagine if somebody shows yeah, up at your somebody door. shows up at your door with somebody wounded and says, "Can we? I need you to take care of them." And be like, well, and also uh, keep them hostage. She's like, "Well, I need you to take care of them, make sure they don't die. Yeah. Also, make sure they don't leave because right. I shot them." So we meet it's sketchy. Though. Yeah, so we're meeting all these different characters. Um, we meet the daughter, Eleanor, who you immediately didn't like Eleanor. I do, did not like Eleanor at all. No. Just high-handed. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think she feels she has more power than... I think maybe her... She doesn't have the power to back up her... Actions. Actions, yeah. The way she runs... The street, she calls it. Yeah. The merchants. She, she runs with an iron fist. and She does, but... She... Well, well, yeah, here's the situation. I just spoke briefly about Richard, the father, but Eleanor runs things in town, uh, in Nassau, on the port. So I mean, maybe it's just because I'm just like, I didn't like have a clue about any of this, so I'm just learning about... This, no, I think you're correct, though. Sort of run... I, I don't know. I think that we're not supposed to like her, and I did at first. But on like my second viewing, I started to see some of the things that you that I found that you had seen, and she. I just think she's a self-serving, high-handed. She she runs off emotion. Uh, that is one of the big themes, and she is advised uh, against this because there are people that help her keep this 
port in check. And yes, she does have a lot of power because if you can't trade with the Guthries in, in this show, they are the trade bosses. So you can't get a go pirate somewhere else. And at this point, Jamaica, Port Royal and all that, that's done. Mm-hmm. This is uh, this is when the British started uh, not being so... This is the last frontier. So yeah. Speak, yeah. Of, uh... This is after Queen Anne's yeah. or the Spanish succession, which we should talk about and all this. And a lot of things play into this. They actually, the British now have, have trade rights on the Atlantic, which it did not before. The Spanish has given, you know, a little bit of a little bit of uh, the the trade uh, to uh, all the countries uh, of Europe for the most part, all the prominent ones, Fran- uh, France and and whatnot. So uh, the, now that they're wetting their beaks, Great. they aren't so they got their hand in the kitty. Yeah, they're not so quick to just ignore and even in the case of Captain Morgan knight people ward people for piracy so in a lot of this has to do with too um that there's now a world um for the first time there's a global economy i guess not for the first time but the, the global economy is growing yeah and it's it's more resemblant of the global the global economy that we would know today and when things are being fenced they're not being taxed yeah that's not good for anybody so uh and also they didn't want to piss off spain because then spain wouldn't be a part of the slave trade right. which you know <laughs> you don't want to lose those rights but uh <laughs> yeah. so yeah just to give you an idea of what the situation is so she does hold an extreme amount of power in nasa but she is very heavy-handed in the way she rules she doesn't her way or no it's her way or no the highway pretty yeah much, or it, whatever. I, I feel that some people will like her like like I, I didn't mind her at first i wasn't like oh she's cool i felt like i'm like yeah she's probably overstepping a little bit but yeah uh, she is a little bit overconfident in her safety i believe i agree and this is where we meet our last and this will be the last little detail we give you before we just give you the broad strokes this is when we meet uh one of the last main characters our group of main characters that are important for right now which is charles vane real pirate uh was a came up under blackbeard very very interesting person and his people that he kind of uh mentored which would be jack rackham Calico mm-hmm. Jack, he's a very, I love him. Yeah. I do too. Um, and, and Bonnie, who was a real life Irish, it, she is portrayed in the show as being uh, like kind of like a, I guess you'd call him a pleb, <laughs> you know, just a low born Irish. But in reality, she was like a rich kid from Ireland, uh, a noble family. And she ran off to go be a pirate, which you think, oh, she's going to get killed. No, she, this is like a lot of uh, actual source accounts of her. Just, Here is a woman that can take care of herself. Yeah, she might have been a little daddy's she girl. She should be the trade boss. Yeah, because she, <laughs> she's honestly. yeah, she's quick to pull these knives, and there's she was legitimately feared within the society at that time and uh, throughout the other pirate crews yeah, and even she, her own. She talks with she doesn't talk much. She talks with her sword and uh, yeah, those knives. Her. Yeah, she's yeah, those she, knives. Uh, and obviously chose to be a pirate, and surprisingly, a large amount of people did. And you're seeing the the inner workings of NASA. You're seeing the pirate crews. This is why this big prize, which is established in the first scene. Yeah. So this is the driving point and the motivation for our main protagonists. Within the first episode, you're aware of, wow, uh, at least me, this isn't how I thought things would have been ran. That's interesting. Uh, this captain's in a tight spot. He seems to be making a lot of decisions for people that he's not. He's just doing it and saying it's the best thing for them, which is arguably not a very good way to operate, but he also has his reasons and is highly competent. There are competing crews for this and that the government of NASA, who is a character in itself, is very heavily involved in these decisions. And so there's a lot of loops that they have to go through. And this might seem boring to people. And, you know, we haven't seen a lot of pirate stuff other than Pirates of the Caribbean, and that's Disney. And they make just a ton, ton of money off that. But the real... um, the real benchmark for for pirate movies, at least, and there's really been no pirate shows, Master and Commander, that is now 10 years ago, with the Russell Crowe. That was a very accurate portrayal, and it looks very similar to how Black Sails looks. Now, you feel that, um, I guess if we want to go into like pros and cons, you feel that some of the stuff looks a little fake? Um, as far as the water? Well, and- yeah. Um <laughs> It's kind of a silly, maybe it's a silly point, but some of it, the only thing 
like especially uh, in the open some of the opening scenes there in the first episode you know when they're showing ships on the water mm-hmm. it looks a little it looks a little that, cheesy I mean, fake it's not a silly comment i mean at I, all to it's, me it just looks like ah eh, that looks a little i don't know like, you're not buying it completely i'm not buying it for the most part i i can see where there could be some complaints now michael bay is attached to this and in the other podcasts i did that that turns off a lot of people don't worry there is like no trace of michael bay but like i said the production of this is on such a large scale that you need at least a michael bay type yeah, because they have to shoot. The, it has to be shot in tanks. Then they have to get partial ships for the ship uh, scenes uh, when they're on deck. It's a crazy amount. Now I, didn't, I don't know if I just didn't pay as much attention, but I, I don't have any. Uh, I think some things are done really well, but on second watches and uh, I mean, I noticed that throughout. It's not you know, it's just not all the scenes, not many, but just sometimes you're not buying like it. You're little, seeing it looks a little like a uh, ship in a bathtub type. Thing. Well, it kind of essentially is. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. The- so I don't know. I mean, I think it's I love it, and I would have never thought I would have loved. A show like this and you know but i had the you know luxury of having some of the background history um because of your podcast well yeah it, they there's always going to be issues with stuff like that but i think that the when you have such a high production cost that they have to fill the time and this is the big complaint about the episodes that we're talking about i i hope we didn't go into too much detail in the first and it doesn't seem like we're going to go into too much detail on the rest but i just wanted to set up what the plot is and, and then kind of talk about the broad strokes about at least how the first half of the season because it's only eight episodes goes they can't just have a first off michael bay doesn't tend to have a lot of uh a lot of um actual or narrative in his movies he's not involved in that the people that uh write this johnny steinberg and i'm i'm blanking on another guy's name right now but they were creators on jericho a lot of the people from jericho are a part of this and they're excellent excellent writers because they fill this time that isn't going to be spent regardless always attacking ships right um on shore uh, and it's kind of like politicking the high seas and some people are, are turned off by this. And I always, it's a general consensus for a lot of people that they hate the first season or they hate the first half of the first season. They think it's too slow. And I think that comes from the expectation of a lot of people from game of Thrones that come over and I'm one of them, but I, I can see that if you're not into history, like I am, that you might find some of these actions boring but because you're not like me that's pausing and being like oh the real story of charles vane i wonder how true they're going to say to that and that's cool that you know the quartermaster is uh has more power than the captain uh, offshore and you know uh but it's, it's a good story it's a very good story it's not just the the detailed um uh, accounts of how things work and they're trying no. to get this gold in and it's nah, i said i want to say it spoiler they don't obtain it too quickly uh, no. and it's not an easy process and it wouldn't have been an easy process, but it is a, a story about how powerful stories are. It's a story, um, giving you the, the origin story of John Silver, because if you've read Treasure Island, you know that he's the most feared pirate, but in this, he's a guy claiming to be a cook that i love john silver <laughs> he, i love him too and that actor is awesome there's a moment yeah. just to show you like how like green of a how green he's portrayed like speaking in in regards to as a sailor he when they they do start to realize who has this page uh in the second episode or right. the first and it's john silver and he has to get off that sh- ship quick and he does like the most epic uh billy flop he just jumps off this way too i mean again yeah that ship's too big for what it would have been but this ship is like one of the huge tall ships uh that you'd see now like uh uh, just for those like sail sailing shows or whatever you want to call them tall ship yeah it's like crazy tall and and it just shows uh what's that funny line because all the men are waiting to go ashore but they all have to take a uh like uh, a dinghy. Yeah, so yeah. it goes by, and this is another thing, you know, you can't go to shore and get to the brothel without, there's the hierarchy, because it goes by how long you've been a part of the... Crew. 
crew. So he's obviously just got on the crew. Uh, and there's one funny guy that says, man, that guy really wants, wants to get to laid. Get laid. Yeah, cause that's why I think he's jumping, <laughs> jumping the ship, but he, it's because he's figuring out all oh, they, they've, they've, they've come to the conclusion that I've got what they need. He is, he's so clever. I just love it. I, I think that it's, you know? it's good because he is so clever, but he's also not like he's always, especially in these first few episodes, this guy is one bad roll of the dice away from just losing his head. You're right. And so is Flint. But for, he's, he knows how to he knows how to make you know lemonade out of lemons or whatever they say you yeah. know I mean he he knows how to play off others uh, ambitions and weaknesses and right. he he like you said it before he didn't read a man this isn't like just some guy like he it's not the origin story of a man that's a great fighter it's not an origin story of a man that is like a man of great physical prowess. It's it, the origin story of a tactician, and a uh, this is a very green, young, charismatic. Yeah. He uses charm a lot to get through in in this uh, series, and this is also because in Treasure Island you always hear about Flint, but he's looms over the story. But he's already deceased by the time the book starts. But he's legendary. All the men that are a part of Treasure Island were were Flint's crew. Yeah, and they they pride themselves on that. So it's like the creators took this story and they wanted to tell you who, because they got to do it themselves. Because there is no, you know, he wasn't real, no source material. So they created a story for who this who would be this man that that everybody feared. It was everybody feared Flint, but mm-hmm. Flint feared Silver. So and this is not at all how it starts. And I'm not going to even tell you how it ends, obviously, but it's this progression of these relationships. And and more than just Flint and Silver, you have Gates and Billy, you have Billy and Silver, Billy and Flint, you have Max, uh, a a very savvy uh, prostitute. Yeah. I, I was trying to think of a better way to say it, like not to be a by whatever. Working I mean that that girl. she is a lady of the night. Yeah. Um, she, you know, you pay for her, for her company. Uh, she is somebody that is also able to see opportunity. It, it's very interesting too because they're not aware. Silver again, he just knows that this is a worth. He has no clue why it's up worth, right? But he sees that. People are going to great lengths to get it. And and that, I mean, maybe some people are like, just get the gold. And at some points during the series, you're like, just go get the gold because then stop them. Uh, there's a lot of uh, when people aren't of the like mind, when people are finally, OK, everybody's now we're going to go get and now somebody fucking does something that right. throws them off and they got to do this. So, yes, yeah. there are those moments. But I really disagree with people on these. I was very happy with these first four episodes, even on first watch, just just watching it as, you know, yeah, of course I did my research but i didn't do like the research i really do until i was gonna do this podcast i was just like wikipedia real quick yeah. to see who this guy is right i wasn't like reading books at the that's library that's kind of what i did with uh victoria you know i was googling yeah facts as i'm watching you're like queen of england you don't <laughs> <What>? say <laughs> holy crap well the only queen i know yeah. is queen elizabeth is she related to the, the queen second. right now yeah. <laughs> so but uh yeah it's it's very intriguing. There's lots of lots of uh, comical characters. They do a good job of. It's been related by the writers when they first created Deadwood on the Sea. Mm-hmm. And Deadwood, I, I know uh, Shannon has not seen Deadwood. Deadwood is yeah. a great show, but it's it's very raw. It's very gritty because the only portrayals we've had is like Captain and Commander was very gritty as well. But that was a movie ten years ago, and now we've had Pirates of the Caribbean, which is not gritty. I mean. Johnny Depp's life is now way grittier, right. but yeah, the the movies I've seen bits and pieces, and I'm sure they have their value. Well, I mean, I see a little bit of, uh, but you do you that see. in Rackham. You, you do. Know, I guess that was a of, and John Silver, really. Yeah, like some they're very kind of silly. They're kind of they're comical. Some of it's comical. Well, they're charming, and, and you know, I mean, yeah. it's not like everybody had. Uh, it doesn't mean they lacked a sense of humor. So I really enjoyed the first four because the first four is essentially the inner workings of this society and it is you're meeting all your characters you're seeing at the end of episode one a duel that comes up and when we're talking about the legend of flint i mean this man has incredible stamina uh it's, this is unrealistic but i mean how many days does it look like this guy doesn't sleep and then he engages in like epic battle like like you know physical fights or yeah i mean that goes yeah he's yeah he's like malnourished mm, yeah. <laughs> he's 
totally fatigued, not enough sleep, and he's able to like just go from one battle, physical battle, to the next. Yeah, and then he's like, well, might as well put it to a duel with a guy that's you know well arrested and right. you know hasn't been just beat he, he up looks and barely haggard. It, I mean, you know, yeah, so that's you know whatever though. He's competent, and that's the one thing that Clint is in sense uh, what you would consider now a libertarian. He doesn't mm-hmm. uh, believe in. And you'll get to see the story of why he has such ill feelings towards uh, England, because he was a naval officer like many are uh, yeah. in this. But he doesn't share the belief that a society only exists if it's governed by, uh, uh, you know, the crown. Right. Anybody's crown. Right. So he believes in, you know, people can make their lives and they can make good govern themselves and make a good life for themselves and yeah and this is kind of jaded with him and all that but that that's his general idea i like the politics of the sea and i think that there's enough action in it enough humor that they have like i said it's kind of like the deadwood uh pirate series but it does have and like i've only seen parts of those pirate movies but i i get like when people would relate it to kind of the funny moments, especially right. with Rackham and Silver. Right. Um, I guess my issues with the first four, if there is any, uh, which I guess there are a few, would be the a little bit of the inconsistency with how the battle that you see, the first battle that you see, the only one you see in the first half is. But that's really like nitpicking after right. I've researched. Probably Jack Rackham, who becomes a character I love, in vain, who becomes a character I love. Some of the storyline with them is a little bit uh, heavy-handed. There's an instance, Jack Rackham is a very intelligent man. He wasn't a very intelligent man. He was very, uh, what you would know now as like, he wasn't a man's man, but he was competent. He won battles with his mind more. Uh, He's very clever and he uh, very well self-educated, I guess, from what the research has told me but and then they they this is his character in the show as well you can tell that he doesn't quite fit in he is the quartermaster for uh charles vane, charles vane. who is the most that is uh the most feared captain other than flint at the moment right. but i feel they're a little heavy-handed with it like we spoke about there's a point where jack rackham is got to or he's trying to get his ship an account mm-hmm. to be the consort on this Urca de Lima chase as that finally becomes something that people are aware of because Flint is finally forced to tell people what he's doing and right. and why they haven't been getting money else he's just going to be killed. But Jack Rackham is trying to get Charles Vane, his his captain, back in the place. So it's like a it, it should have been and it would have been in the later seasons like a real meeting of the minds in one of these scenes because he has to put doubt into Gates. Uh, mind who is an older gentleman that is the quartermaster we spoke up for flint uh he has to put some doubt in his mind and it's about like a three minute conversation of just like people are gonna wonder if they should add a younger captain and gates like ah oh, shit you're right and he just like <laughs> flips right away so like right. like i'm like Ugh. i'm that's, like man yeah. they spent some time on some shit they shouldn't have and that was yeah that's not clever that's he just said some like exactly what he wanted yeah, he's like, hey, but, you shouldn't do that. I should do that. He's like, oh, you're right. Thank you. A little, yeah, wishy washy. Yeah. yeah. And Easily. Charles Vane is, um, he's played by Zach McGowan. Uh, the huge fan base for him. And I love him. He's been in Shameless and all that. But his acting is not that great for the first season. And it could have been the writing for him. And maybe you're not supposed to like him as much. I mean, I know you didn't like him. I didn't like him uh, to start now. Yeah, I mean, he is, you meet him on NASA just like, you know, you meet everybody else. That's why it's it's such, it's, it's, that's why it's so good, because, you know, you, yeah, and you start off not liking him, and, you know, it's a good story, so. Yeah, it's a good story, and it's just, uh, his intentions and all that, I guess, I mean. I mean, he's kind of like a mess in. Well, he is, and he has to find he himself. Really I guess my biggest issue, I guess it doesn't even pertain to the first four episodes because it's after that that he does this. It's kind of like, it's kind of one of those he has to find himself, like uh, Shannon just said, arcs. And he does, and I just find it a little silly in the way that he does. But, I mean, this is nitpicking. Also, you will hear a lot of times that there's a lot of gratuitous nudity, and there is in the first few episodes, but like I said at the beginning, I hate to say it's cheesy, but sex sells. And you want to know what? If you want to break into Hollywood and you want to make something, uh, you have to answer to network execs, and they want ratings. So, 
it happens, but they cut it down. You can you can literally see this series even until the end. Like I when I finished this series to kind of cap this off, I felt like the last episode was like this, uh, like the purest example of how I feel they wanted this series to be. So you can see them getting more and more trust through the network. And this is me just like really analyzing it. Don't think that you're going to watch a series that you have to I mean, like watch. I don't watch. think it was repulsive though or anything either. Um, yeah. And that, I know, mean, if you so, didn't either and I mean, yeah. you're not a prude, but you no, I'm not a prude at all. And, but I didn't think, I mean, it, a lot of it is focused around this brothel to begin with. So, and what goes on at brothels and yeah, good hey. conversation, good yeah. conversation. Like I, that one essay that I read, uh, breaks down everything. And this guy complains about everything. The women didn't have enough lesions the prostitutes didn't have their teeth weren't missing i'm like well man you know you go you go watch schindler's list or something if you're looking at which is yeah. another round that's a great movie that everybody right. should watch but hey that's that's gonna get shot down right away i, I mean, mean they didn't need to have that in this for it to be a great story. yeah in intelligent people again like we mentioned with the other um issues you don't always have to see it you know i mean you you understood that that was probably a problem that, that was the, a problem yeah but, people didn't you know? smell great back then yeah we, get, we don't need yeah. to like i don't need to sit there and watch it yeah they don't they don't need to spell that out for me no. uh and there's a big difference between um kind of just making things just more appeasing on screen than making people abide by 21st century uh, ideals and ethics in a 18th century situation. Right. Uh, they they were still treated as prostitutes, and we see that with Max. Yes. Uh, I had, I guess that would be one of my other issues, Max's decision. Uh, there is a woman that is um, within the dealings that we see for this schedule that is so important for this end goal of this gold is negotiated on a few different levels kind of john silvers i, I kind of see her as like the other like side of the coin or like the mirror to a point of john yeah. silver because she's also very intelligent but it, I, I guess the main thing they share is they're underestimated she's another person that can she knows how to read people she's observant she observes what's going on and, and she can play she it sees that this is important just like he did so there's no better like uh, training for if you're going to work in like any type of public service or any type of uh, business where you have to negotiate than uh, being a prostitute in a brothel. It's yeah. I know many women that are very you successful CEOs. Very good job shadowing. That's how they started off. I yeah. highly recommend yeah. it. Yeah. Especially for young women. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> um, yeah, you know, so you get to, but she is, she is captured or she's taken and there, this happens very quickly because it doesn't work out for her with trying to line up with John Silver to get rid of this. To, to sell to this, sell this schedule, schedule that they've obtained. That everybody's looking for. Yeah, because, and again, they don't even know what it is. But, right. the, but Vane is going for it. Guthrie's going for it. Flint is going for it. And he's finally let other people know. Now, now what is happening is exactly what he feared to happen. And it's becoming the talk of the town, and right. it makes it way more difficult because every crew on this island is uh, contending for it. Right. So, yes, I mean, long and short of it, things don't work out for her, and she's taken, and uh, she's just brutally beat. And yeah. it's very, it's not very, I mean, it's very disturbing the thought of it, but right. it's still like they, they don't, don't really show it. it. It's not a smear film. Yeah. Yeah. No, and but, it, it, I mean, it's. But the, you get the point. Yeah, you get the point. Yeah, yeah. that's what you, they drive it home. You don't have to, I mean, if you, good writing, you don't need to show exactly everything. Right. You know, there's there's a thin line but yeah i really enjoyed it uh, a lot even on first watch and i'm obviously like a huge advocate of it now and want people to go watch it on hulu and shannon thank you for watching it but i i always get that in the few reviews that are out there and there's not many that it, oh it's so slow and nothing happens and it's like well i don't know what to tell no, you man. i don't i disagree with that completely yeah the, something's always going happening you know i'm not going to claim that it's the most intelligent show ever made but it is smart uh, in the relationships between everybody are calculated oh, yeah. and it's the scheming and the angles and the in the characters are so 
complicated, you know? Yeah. I mean, this is a, there's a lot of aspects of Deadwood and something I think like they did better. Everybody's got their own agenda, but then they all have one big agenda, you know? It's, it's it's the issue of these days, like people like the, like, and I love it too, like in Game of Thrones, Jamie Lannister. Oh, I love it because uh, you start off hating him and, mm-hmm. you know, he's a good guy, but he is seen as a bad guy. And that's like a very like simple like example of how to like create a uh, anti-hero or a uh, your modern day like a Breaking Bad Walter uh, White situation where you know you're rooting for somebody but you don't agree with everything they're doing which is you know how things go now back in the day it was there's a good guy that's a bad guy mm-hmm. you know now it's yeah you know everybody's a little bit of good everybody's, everybody mm-hmm. is it's gray but. Yeah, like the example of people that like Game of Thrones, I feel like I don't get when they're like, oh, it's too slow and all that. It's like, well, you know, you love these characters for a lot of the same reasons that you love the characters in Black Sails. And yeah. there's actually a lot. Oh, if you like Littlefinger, I think that you put season two, three, four, Jack Rackham against Littlefinger mm-hmm. and he'll he'll bust his ass. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Uh, he has a far better library <laughs> than Littlefinger. So, uh, yeah, it's got it's got its pros and cons. If I guess that I wouldn't assume that most people would be totally sold off the four episodes. If I if I look at it in a broader sense, I was. Uh, But I really think that get through season one because it's fair to say that you found it slow. I disagree, but I, I, I don't find it obscene. I can see why. Why some people would find it slow. Yes. Yeah. But Shannon didn't find it slow. I didn't find it slow. I talked to a guy on Yahoo Chats, which is yeah. a thing still, or AOL. So, uh, I mean, hey, you know, give it, a, give it a go. I mean, we're, do, yeah, we're, we're, we're late to the party with it, but yeah. I, I, I'm, I love this series and I do feel that now that it's on Hulu, it's going to hit its stride. And the people that are involved in this series are so, they're so, um, appreciative of their fan base. And, there is only one podcast that I will say has done a good job with it and it's Fathoms Deep. And if you listen to that podcast, which I have, trust me, no, I'm not going to get paid anything. Uh, and they're not even that large of a podcast. They're they're larger than I am at this point. But, you know, they're regular women that just are enthusiasts and they, they do a great job. And they've had every single main actor and yeah, I think almost the whole entire cast on the show more than once. For not just a 20 minute, you know, little, hey, thanks for watching. Two to three hour interviews with these people. And That's amazing. Yeah, you don't see that. That's not a norm, you know. I mean, you don't get it. I'm not going to say anything. I think people, I mean, Kit Harrington obviously can't even go out in the street without being, you know, attacked. But I, I at least, I've never heard him even on a podcast. So they're very appreciative of their fan base. They still are. They're still going on this show. I, I, I will recommend it, you know, even though I don't have any relation with them officially. But it, it is a good cast. And uh, it, it's a real good uh, way to, you know, accompany this one uh, because you get these interviews with these with these actors and they are appreciative of the people that have recognized them. And the show has won one Emmy for um, actually what Shannon finds to be an issue for the uh um, for yeah, for the vision. Now that I just remembered that, yeah, I have her on. I make for her. I, I, it, it, it's uh, for cinematic effects or something. Yeah. yeah. So it's funny though because I like I ask you to do this, and now it just just clicked in my head that the one thing you brought up. It's like no, listen, you idiot, you dumb dumb. It's good. Well, then why did it win? These are these people were the Matrix people. I'm just remembering. Yeah, the Matrix blew my mind when I was 14. Yeah. So yeah. Take well, that and shove didn't it. Watch it, and I won't. Yeah, but fair, fair argument. So, thank you, Shannon, for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. We are going to do the next four episodes very soon, and we're just going to try to give you a broad overview of uh, what the series is about, and hopefully, you can watch this, um, the episodes, and then you can listen to this or vice versa, and either agree with us or disagree with us. It's a conversation, and we want you to have it, and I want you to enjoy these shows. My name's Justin Thomas. Thank you again, Shannon. Make sure to like and subscribe. It's very important to like and subscribe on the YouTube channel, even if you're just listening to this on one of the podcast platforms. The YouTube channel is the YouTube channel is pivotal uh, for analytics at this point. So again, I definitely understand that a lot of these casts play better uh, through the podcast platforms. A lot of the times, we are working on doing more videos. 
in getting some other stuff set up. But yeah, I understand a lot of you are listening in your cars and stuff like that. But just stop by the YouTube channel, subscribe, hit that like, and we will see you guys in a few days.